Welcome to Harvest to Pour, the business of beverages, with your host, Matthew Schiff. This is the podcast for all of those who are involved in the agriculture all the way to the distribution of beverages. And now your host, Matthew Shipp. Hello and welcome to Harvest to Pour. I'm your host, Matthew Shipp, and today I am here with Adam Feller, the founder of Avidity Creative, a food and beverage branding agency for emerging CPG. For some of us that don't know what that is, that's consumer packaged goods that are ready for the next level. So how are you doing today, Adam? Matthew, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the chat with you. All right, great. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. Uh, I'm really excited to find out a lot more about uh, Avidity Creative and how you're helping um, the food and beverage industry. So let us know a little bit about yourself uh, and how Avidity came to be. Yeah, definitely. So let's just start back to when I was graduating college. So, you know, I graduated from a a small private school with a graphic design degree. And I'm one of probably the few people in my generation to say that I got a job in my field right away, but also have stuck with my field over coming on 13 years now. So, but anyway, so, so graphic design, my first first time I or my first job out of college was an interesting one. It was at the Omaha Zoo. Um, It's one of the biggest zoos in the country. And I was on the graphics team just doing signage design, environmental design, and, you know, worked on, it was surprisingly one of my more corporate jobs, but I was basically, you know, design, like I said, design signage around the campus. So was there for about a year, then went to a social media startup company that died just like a lot of the other ones <laughs> shortly, shortly after. So we were, I was there for about a year also, and then, then went to a business publication company where I was designing you know, editorial advertisements. And then lastly, I went to a, a full service ad agency, Lessing Flynn, and, and it was like one of the oldest ones in the Midwest. So, and there we did all types of advertising campaigns. And I mean, we focused on agriculture and stuff, but so personally, my background has been in graphic design for a while now and, and you know, really all different types of practices when it comes to design and creativity. But all along the way, I was just doing freelance work on the side. I was doing, I had a passion for branding, I had a, a knack for designing logos and I was doing a lot of them. And eventually it got to a point where I was making more money on my work than I was at my full-time job. Um, and I was young enough and at an age where you know, our, my family lifestyle at the time was at a point where it was, it was a good time to just take a chance at starting my own company. I, it was kind of a goal of mine to always start company of some kind, you know, I liked doing graphic, graphic design. That was what I wanted to do. So decided to take that leap and I started Avidity in 2017 and making the plans up to that. I suppose we started planning for it in late 2016, but around the same time found out we were pregnant with our uh, first child. So <laughs> All right. my wife and I had a that decision works. to make, we had a decision to make of like, well, do we, do we keep pursuing this or do we put it on the back burner? We kind of decided together that you know, it was going to be a lot easier to give it a try now with a baby rather than saying, let's hold off, knowing that we were going to have multiple kids and, you know, we get five years down the road, we have two kids. It's going to be a lot harder to start that, just start another company. So mm-hmm. started Avidity and at the time it was just me and I was doing branding and I started focus pretty, pretty quickly right after starting, wanted to focus on some sort of niche and ultimately, you know, dwindled things down to just focusing on food and beverage. And ultimately, like I would, when I started, actually, I wanted to work with restaurants and cafes and stuff. I didn't think I'd be doing packaged products, but it wasn't long after that, I realized that CPG was kind of the direction I wanted to head. So it was upon me then to learn as much as I could about the industry. I had some experience with it really, but it was mostly just with working with previous clients. It was just, I had a couple other coffee clients that I had worked with and one or two beer clients, I think at the time. Okay. But I, I just kind of figured that was where I wanted to go was, was in CPG. So built Avidity to really become an expert and a leader in the creative side, the, the marketing side of CPG food and beverage brands and started to connect with that, that industry a lot. And, you know, now we're at a point where we actually have four people in the company. We still focus on the creative side of things, but we do everything from design related to from, from logos to brand strategy, to packaging. Those are big things for us. We started getting we started getting into being Shopify web web experts. So we're we'll build Shopify websites. We'll also do digital marketing around Shopify, and, and then we also have started on content creation too. So mostly mostly the social content creation. So just doing lifestyle photos, gifts, stop stop motion animation stuff, short video reels, things like that. So 
but everything we do is all focused on on CBG food and beverage is all focused on the branding and the creative side of things. And yeah, that's kind of where we're at today. So I know it's a long roundabout answer. I tend to tend to ramble on, but it was a long path to get here. It's been fun and, and we're learning a lot and we're also doing a lot of really great work for our clients too. So how long did it take you to start to realize the CBG was for you? I mean, I, I know the sort of the beverage industry found me. I didn't find it. It just kind of, some people saw, hey, this is a, this is a problem that you, you work on that, you, that I need. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Where'd you, where'd you kind of start in your, in your so, career from starting 2017? Yeah. So, so taking actually a few steps even further back again to, to college. So part of our, our senior criteria that we had to, which was a senior art show and graphic design that just meant like you pick what you want to work on and you create the whole art show. And so what I actually did was created a handful of different, like sophisticated candy brands. They were all just mm. fictitious things that I made up. And so I designed logos and I designed packaging for them. So that was kind of where it actually interestingly started never. And, and I, I do remember a conversation with my advisor in my senior year. She's like, well, what do you want to do with your career? I'm like, well, if I could be designing logos and packaging every day, that would be my ultimate goal. I never thought it'd happen, but here we are, you know, years later. But so how did I decide that that was the direction I wanted to go? When I knew that we had to niche down because around, at least locally around Des Moines, Iowa, where I'm at, there's a lot of small agencies and there was no way for me to compete locally with them. And I figured my clientele is going to be nationwide and not just Des Moines. So I'd, I had to figure out like, how, how, what do I have over, um, you know, these large ad agencies that are doing these huge campaigns and stuff. Well, I can be very specific in what I'm working on, not work with everyone. I can work with a specific industry, become a master at it and understanding what, understanding consumer behavior. So this is all things that I decided to teach myself, but how did I get there was I looked at the clients that I've worked with just doing the freelance stuff and really had narrowed it down to, so I had worked with some like event branding I had worked with a lot of like construction and industrial clients. And then the third sort of pillar or silo was these food and beverage related clients. So I kind of put them all together, like the restaurants and the coffee and the, the beer, like they were all kind of together. It really is a like strategic business development practice, I guess, or, or, or I don't know, what are the words I'm for here? But the way that I narrowed those down is like the events were all done, like a lot of pro bono stuff. It was all trade in kind. So there's no way for me to build a business around that, that I knew of. Construction yeah. industrial, like, yeah, there, there was lots of money there, but it was from a creative perspective, it's very boring. Like there's a, every architecture a or like, exactly, <laughs> is every architecture company or construction company, they all look the same. Like there, there's some good brands, but like, there's just, there's not a lot of, you know, so for, mm -hmm. for creativity, it was not fun. And the food and beverage sort of category had a little bit of both. Like there was enough for me that I felt like I could build a business off of it. But it was fun. Like we're working with different types of products all the time, different types of brands, you know, brands that are you know, fun, whimsical, ones that are more clean, sleek, and sophisticated, like all, there's a huge spectrum for that. So that was, to me, it just, it seemed like a no brainer after I narrowed those down. And so it was just, from there, it's just a matter of learning as much as I could. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, lots of just in time learning. I'm learning that myself. Yeah. So just to shift a little, go into your, going into your branding and some of the logo and the packaging design. I just was looking at your site and you said, and on your site, it's, uh, I like this, your logo says, we'll design for food and drink. And you just mentioned <laughs> trade and kind. I was wondering if everybody tongue in cheek tried to, tried to move that way on you a, a couple of times. So, it's like, oh, well, it says it right here on the label. Yeah, exactly. We, we've had that once or twice. Like there's, and it was okay. mostly early on where like I had clients who because they, because we, we work with a lot of startups, we still do work with a lot of yeah. like startups and emerging brands, like the ones who now we're getting getting more into like the ones who have been around for a few years and they kind of realize, all right, we get some traction. Our branding that we got on Fiverr, or we had my cousin Joe do, like, is not really cutting it. So those are the ones we tend to to get more work with now. But we do also work with a lot of startups. So, but but early on, I did have a few clients who said, well, what if I give you a percentage of our of our company? And like, okay, like this sounds great in theory, but I can't, there's no way for me to know. And there's so many things that are out of control from like, not in my hands to determine how successful your company is. We design your branding. We give you the strategies. Like we give you the tools, but we can't do it for you. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're, especially at the size that we were, like, there's only so much that we can do. So I'm not going to, 
wasn't going to trade that. There are like, you know, there are times where we're like, Hey, like, we'll give you, we'll give you this, a discount. If you give us a bunch of this, your, your product, because like, we just love the product and it's really, it tastes good or whatever, you know? So there's things like that, but what it's not, it's not as, not as common. And they have to, they have to really sell us on it because there's a lot of products that we get that I'm a pretty picky eater. So it's kind of hard to like satis- <laughs> satisfy my palate anyways. All right. Yeah. I've, I've done early on, I've done a, my number of workshops for a free tumbler, a bag of co- a couple bags of coffee. Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't cost us to do anything that then, then it's a little bit easier, but if he wants to come up with your whole branding concept, it's just, that's a different story. Not going to happen. But yeah, like I'll come, I'll come give a talk to someone or, or I'll give you something else to exchange. But like okay. we've, well, I've done like t-shirt exchanges with clients all the time. Like, Hey, like I'll give you some shirts. You give us some shirts. We'd love to, we'd love to to rep our brands and you know our we try to get like nice soft comfortable shirts for our clients to wear too whether the same as they are well that's cool that's cool it's good to know it's good for a listener here to know, know that too if anybody's looking to get that branding started also yeah. speaking of branding you you do separate yourself here is another part is that you're reaching a limit and are ready to hit the next level with your brand so what is the next level for a food or beverage brand product what where, what is that next level that, that where you come in yep so a lot of times like I was saying, there, there's, there, and there's, there's sort of two, two categories there. So there's the ones who have been in business for three or four years. Now they're getting some traction. And like I said, they, they realize that their branding from, from the start is, wasn't great. They just were trying to cut some costs. So there, so, so that, that sort of category is you want to, you want to go from, you want to go from, from a proven product that you have already. But now you want to take it into a next territory. So like you're maybe you're already in a dozen of your sort of local grocery stores, but now you want to reach outside of your state or outside of your gym, your, your sort of drivable region. And you want to start mm-hmm. getting just bigger. So a lot of times that means that you need to re-strategize what your, what your branding is or what your message is, but not only just your branding, like how, how are your, what are your tactics? Like, what, how are you actually reaching that new audience of people who don't know who you are already? Cause a lot of times you're working, working locally, you just get the word of mouth, like the buzz around town and people know who you are and they see your products in the store shelves and kind of, you know, reinforces that recognition. But, but if you're going into new territory, that's, that's the type of brand that like, you're at a point where we we'd love to work with you and, and like, whether it's helping you strategize how to launch and how to get into a new market. Or just creatively, like, what do you need? Is it, do you need shelf talkers? Do you need displays? Like what sort of things are going to actually visually get people to, to, to see and to recognize your brand when they're not looking for it. And that's the, that's the hardest part. So the second category is a little bit earlier on, or people are just, they're just going to farmer's markets. And like I said, they probably also have already just done a logo or a label themselves on their, mm-hmm. we're talking in this podcast, we're talking mostly to beverages and you know, you probably, whether it's coffee or if it's something else, like you've put a label, mm-hmm. you've just put a label together in Canva and Canva is great. We actually use Canva sometimes our, ourselves, but it's, it's not made for professional designers. And there's a reason people go to professional designers for things, but, but, and we can get back into that as a whole. <laughs> I'm sure we can dig deep into that too. <laughs> whole other, whole other topic, but, but it's but that, that emerging, that other emerging brand, like you've hit the, you've hit the limits of what you can reach. Like if you're doing. You're going to farmers markets and you're doing great, but like if you if a company is just you or you and a partner or a friend or whatever, you don't want to spend every single weekend at these farmers markets. You need to get to a point where the business is a little more self-sustaining, doesn't require you to basically be there selling product. And that and that's the sort of limit that I'm talking about. Like you've reached you've reached that point. So like the next level now is getting into stores, getting into more stores getting stuff to sell on stores and getting stuff to sell, sell online. Um, you know, it's a whole, that's kind of like that next level. So that's what we're talking about when we're referring to that. So getting into that new tori- new territory, that's, you're almost having to, well, I would say rebrand, but re-strategize how you're doing it. And that's what you, you brought in some strategy here is you, you, so you help with that piece as well. We definitely do. Yep. So, so coming up with a strategy. For us, like I said, we still, we focus on the mar- or the marketing side, the, the image side. Like we're not, we can't mm-hmm. handle your distribution or your, man- or your, yeah. your manufacturing. That's, that's not us. We don't understand that. And I don't, I don't try to, and I won't ever try to be an expert there. We can probably learn a lot ourselves, but for the marketing side, like you still have to have, 
a strategy when you're going into these new territories, getting into new stores. Number one, that's like, how are you going to get into the new stores? Not every store is just going to, you know, immediately accept you that they've never heard of your brand. But, but if you've reached a point where you've kind of, you're maximizing your output or your shelf velocity on the stores that you're in right now, then it's pretty easy to go to new retailers and be like, Hey, like our, our, our stuff is performing very well on these shelves. We think it would perform well in your store as well. But where we play into that is like helping you to d develop what that message is that you're giving to the store, the, the purchasers, the buyers, but also what's the message you're giving to that customers to make them want to pick up the products, you know, whether it's doing sam free sampling is a big thing for us that we recommend. But what's the, you know, we like to suggest putting shelf toppers or offering cardboard POP displays because retailers typically enjoy having those things because it helps sell the product, which helps make them money. But what, what, what can we do creatively and what sort of strategy can we build to launch into those new, and of course, just developing a timeline and a process. Like that's a lot of that comes down to your manufacturing and distribution as well, but like, how can we work what we need to do creatively or marketing wise into launching into those new markets? All right. So, so hopefully answer your question a bit. That's, no, that's great. That was really good. Cause I want to get into, I, I typically talked when I talk to um, beverage owners, producers, I ask them about their harvest to pour journey. And typically the harvest is where they're sourcing their, their materials to create their product and make it uniquely theirs. I mean, there's hundreds and thousands of coffee shops and roasteries and breweries and, and wineries, but they each have their own take and their own sure. specific. And then the pour is sort of the marketing side. Initially, I, was, I thought I was going to ask you, well, oh, we're just going to stick with the poor because this is sort of the marketing and distribution. But actually, you are trying to visually tell a story on a package, mm -hmm. their package, right there, one shot. I don't, I, I know our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter, so you got to catch that. That's got to tell a story of their of their product enough that somebody want to pick it up off the shelves, take a look at it, and think about buying it. So, how do you tell, or how do you how do you get into that point where you can tell? the harvest to pour journey on their packaging. Yeah. It's very difficult <laughs> uh, because like you said, like it has to be very short. So we've, we've mm -hmm. gotten pretty good at coming up with you know, headlines, taglines for the brand that can be used on packaging, on websites and marketing materials. But how can you quickly get that across? And the story is, so it's always interesting for us to learn and understand what our client's story is and like, what is, what is their brand story? Not just like the personal story, but their brand story. Mm -hmm. Because we like, we work with a lot of coffee brands who've worked with over 70 in the last few years now. There's a lot of very similar stories. Like, as you can imagine, like you work with that many clients in one, one category yeah. that gives me a lot of overlap and coffee itself, you know, the journey from like you, you mentioned harvest to pour, like starting with the beans, the beans mm -hmm. coming to America or wherever our clients are at, roasting the beans, packing the beans, grind, you know, grinding the beans if they need to, and then, you know, the beans getting to the customers, but. Mm -hmm. Along there, along the way, how does our brand that we're working with have their hands on that story, on that journey of the beans? You know, and if it's not coffee, what is, what is your, what is the why, right? That's so, so we dig into those things. Like, that's what we do first is like understanding like, well, why is your beverage, your, the juice company that you're, that you're making, like, what, obviously what makes you different, but like, why are you doing this? There's no one, no one asked you to, but like, why, why did you decide to start the company? There's always a, there's always a reason. It's usually tied to some personal, uh, personal background story, but those are things that the customers, they don't really care about so much right away. You know, if they're going to make a purchase, I'll come into some, some strategy for like shelf presence here in a second. But mm -hmm. if they're, the customers are going to make a purchase on the shelf, they don't have time to, to look at a label and read your whole background and what's the story of this brand. They care about what the crazy flavor is and like, how does it taste? The problem is they can't taste it while it's in the packaging, which is why we always suggest like free sampling and give out as much free product as you can. But getting that point across, it's more about, it's more about what sort of, what sort of feeling can you get across quickly? Not what's the, what's the, not what's the literal story, not what's the literal message. But what's the feeling that you can get across? And that's where like visuals come into play a lot. So your logo design has, plays a big part of it, but it, in our minds, and I hate this because I'm a logo designer and like, I want the logo to be the most important thing because I'm selfish and that's why, <laughs> that's why, but, but in our, in my mind, strategically, 
your packaging design is more important than your logo. It's like one A and one B, but the packaging to me comes first. Absolutely. That's um, what now. So in that packaging, like it's not just, it's not just the logo design, but it's the colors you're using. What patterns are you using? Are you using photographic imagery? Is there some sort of interactive element to the packaging? Can you make the shape of a unique, but like all of these things, all of these things within your packaging can get a point across very quickly. And it may not be in words. Like I said, it's not, it may not be something, some funny witty tagline, cause you're not going to put that on the front of your packaging because you don't have space, especially beverages. You're pretty limited in space. If you're on a bottle of some kind, like the only time it really gets some, some space to work with is on coffee bags and cause they're a bit bigger, but that's usually, a, I mean, it's. I'll call it a beverage, but it's roasted beans. But if you're looking at a bottled, a bottled beverage of some kind, you're going to work with a label. It's probably going to be a limited size. So you don't have space to fit your logo, the brand or the, the, the product's name, the flavor description, the net weights, all those other requirements, like to fit some sort of witty tagline, it's not going to work. All that stuff is going to go around the back, but it's hard to get someone to pick up a product, turn it around just because they want to read a story. That's probably not going to happen. So what can you do with colors and shapes and imagery to get this point across of, of what's the brand story, how does it resonate? And then, you know, what are the benefits of it? No, sorry. I, like I said, no, I like, could go, I, I could go on here and like shift and like, I, um, I'm really enjoying the philosophy like, but, and but. yeah, I'm really enjoying the philosophy and the direction you're coming from. This it gives kind of people this, this new perspective of why it's so important. And I really like that transition. You really explained that next level really well is, is, you know, getting into unknown territory. You've really got to change your strategy, update your story and make your packaging talk to a customer that may have never heard of you before, but was curious enough to ask, why should I try this? What? So when it comes to actually, you know, I'm going to wait on that because I was going to ask for a quick sto story. You worked on a particular package of a bagged milkshake. And then this is comes from my episode 19 interview with Gail from Pivot North. Yeah. So yeah, she's been great to know. work with too, by the way, everyone, if you're, if you're looking for someone that does what she does, the consulting, the brokering, it, she's really great. So anyways, that's Absolutely. my testimony to Gail. She's going to work with. I'm sure she'll appreciate that. But now take us through that because all of a sudden I was like, as I was looking through, I was like, oh, these are just two little cups in a bag. Keep the, keep it on more of a milkshakey. So there's a technology in there. But no, most people are going to care about the technology. They're going to care about it. They open it up. They get what they get with their what was promised. How did you kind of tell the story on that on that packaging and uh, what was what was the feel on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, well first let me plug our, our website. We actually just launched the case study for for that brand, and there's actually two case studies. It was big enough for us that we we split it into two. One that was focused on our rebranding of so Fancy Freeze is the name of the brand, and I'll mm -hmm. uh, get some context here in a second about that. Uh, but we did did a, a case study that's just about our rebranding um, with them, and then a second one that was rebrand or uh, uh, designing in the strategy just for uh, the packaging of that product. So go check those out at avidityacreative.com. You'll, you'll see those and, and can hear a little bit more than probably would all have a chance to talk about here today. But I, uh, we also can't show visuals on a on a podcast, so you, you can check yeah. those out and see what we're talking about. But so to give some context on on that client, so Fancy Freeze is a Boise, Idaho, like 1950s era diner. It's a, I've been out there actually. So it's really, really good food. I can vouch for that with really good food and, and the milkshakes are awesome too, but they're kind of your, every city has this sort of hot spot 1950s era diner that somehow made it and like it just, it's just the place that everyone goes. So that's what they are to Boise, Idaho. They have a couple locations, but in working with, with Gail at Pivot North Consulting, they were adding this retail product and it was. Uh, soft serve milkshakes that are, you know, freezer section shelf, shelf stable. So when we went through, I guess, and what makes that unique is that like being in a freezer section, I think Gail talked about this a lot, so I won't repeat a lot that's from her, her podcast episode, but basically what the, what's hard about doing that is the freezer section has to be so cold for ice cream, like just your regular traditional ice cream, that soft serve isn't usually something you see there because soft serve, soft serve needs to be kept a little bit warmer so it doesn't freeze completely solid. So the packaging they created was unique for just like the structure of it. But anyway, so our part in that, and you asked about like relaying the story of that brand and like, how do we, how do we come up with the, the, the packaging design for them? So being, 
as part of this rebranding, like we wanted to keep the essence of the original brand. So there were some pieces that were important that we kept. They had this like ribbon logo, they had this bright pink color and a few other things, but we wanted to kind of bring that into a more contemporary feel. We didn't make drastic changes to it, but we did update everything and made it all kind of work together. But and as far as the branding goes, we kept that pink as a main color, but coming to the packaging side of things now. So of course we were going to be consistent, and cohesive with the rest of the brand, but speaking just on the packaging, we knew that this being a new product that people have not seen on a grocery store shop before, but they've had many times at a diner. We needed to be clear about what this was. There's probably a little bit of educating because when you see the product, it's in a pouch and you don't see the cups right away until you buy the product and, or buy the pouch mm -hmm. and get the, the cups of ice of milkshake out of the, out of the pouch. So we needed to be clear about what's actually inside of this. And the way that we went about that was pretty simple. It's just like the, how we use photography to show a, a milkshake and we showed a milkshake that's like kind of melting and oozing. So it's just showing that it's like soft serve and it's not like a scoop of hard traditional ice cream um, that you've blended up or something. And we showed the, the product just as it would be when you start to, when you start to drink it, consume it. But then the rest of the packaging design of the pouches anyways, is just very clear about what's inside. So when you go look at the case study and you see these the images of the pouch, you'll see in big bold black letters upon the packaging, strawberry milkshake. Like it's just huge. And that's, that was our focus was like trying to get this product to be very clear about what this is, about what's, what, what's inside. So basically you see this image of the milkshake right in the middle and there's, there's little like floating ingredients. So there's little cut strawberries and the mint chocolate chip has mint and mint, or mint leaves and, and chocolate. And of course there's a chocolate one too. So that's very clear then about what the product is. You can see the imagery, you can see the ingredients, you see the words that, that they're this big and bold, but, but also what that allowed us to do was the rest of the pouch, which is a pretty, pretty big usable space for packaging was pretty clean. Like we didn't put any textures to it. We didn't put a lot on a lot else on the front. Like there's some little call outs of, of what's like the, the benefits of the product, but you know, there wasn't much else. So like this bright color that we made. So we made a different color for each flavor. We didn't, we didn't go with the actual brand colors here. We just went with a, a color for each flavor. So strawberry is pink, mint is a light, light green. And, and the chocolate is of course a brown. So those colors reiterate or reinforce the flavor in your mind because everyone knows what those flavors taste like. It's just, how can we cross what, which flavor, which flavors these are, but that all those colors are already bright and it allows the packaging to stand out very well on a shelf too. So oh. yes, I think, I think that's a lot. That's great. A lot there. I know, but there was no, that was great. There. I really like the way you broke down the strategy towards your, your visual story of for the branding. That's, that's great. Well, yeah. I just want to talk about that. Control. Okay. Yeah. We can look, let me finish one more point too about that. Sorry. Yeah. Look, I mean, don't mean to cut you off, but we do focus a lot on like who the customers are. So like everything that we do, we, we, uh. we, our philosophy is like, we, we want to understand as much as we can about the customer, not only demographics, but personalities, lifestyles, characteristics, what's important to them. And we know like in this particular customer, we know what they're used to with a diner, but a milkshake is not something that people are drinking because they want to be healthy. It's like, we're not putting any sort of health benefit call outs on this packaging. Like this is, this is very, it's like a delicious product. It's, it's just like oozing with flavor, but that also directed, like directed to us where we wanted to take the, the photograph on the, the front. So having this melting thing, it's not clean. It's not supposed to be like whatever you ever had a milkshake, at least if you're a little kid, that's not ended up all over their hands and their shirts. So that was kind of the, the, the image that we wanted to get across. So coming, tying that back to what I talked earlier about stories and how we show that visually, that's where that came from. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's, this is going to be very helpful. Like kind of really helps kind of get your idea about what you're really doing for these brands. So speaking of the brands or speaking of when, when it comes to helping a food or beverage with their branding and building this new strategy, what are some of the challenges do you often see they're coming to you with that, you know, that you see kind of repeating themselves and maybe they're, they're more unexpected challenges that other than I need to do brands so I can sell more stuff. So are you, are you asking what challenges are they seeing within their own company that we help with? Or are you saying what challenges, what challenges do we as a company have working with them? So like, like, cause yeah, give me an example, give me an example. 
an That's example good. of that would be like they're coming to us with a, a crappy logo that they don't want to change. So how do we yeah, what, what are the biggest challenges that are coming with you? Yeah. What, what do you see a lot? Maybe, maybe it's the pushback of change. Yeah. So some, it's not necessarily even the pushback of change. There's a lot of the clients, like I said, are coming to us in this, what we call it emerging, emerging brands. They're growing up. They're realized they came to us because they're realizing what they have isn't mm-hmm. either not working right now, or it's not going to cut at the next level. We had one client black and bold, who's probably our, our biggest client. When they came to us, they were six months into their business and it wasn't like, it was two guys who were roasting, um, roasting beans in their garage and they had aspirations to get into major retail as quick as they could. One of the owners had already, uh, he had previously worked at Target Corporate, I think in the purchasing section or yeah. purchasing department. So he kind of understood the process, but so they had actually reached out to Target, like Whole Foods, I think a couple others at the time too got a lot of the same feedback. And one of the, the, the few negatives that they had was your branding and your packaging isn't ready for major retail. It's like, and when you're, when you're Target, you can tell someone that, <laughs> you know, like your local grocery store may be like, okay, like your brand, like it's, yeah, it looks like right. it's mod, it looks like it's mod pa, whatever, but Target's just going to tell you no right away. So, so that was their, their part of them reaching out to us was, is to, was to help with that. So of course we did a short rebranding and redesigned all their packaging. Looky here, they're in, they're in every, every, yeah, almost, almost every target. They're in every Whole Foods. They're in whatever, wherever you, whatever your, your local or regional grocery store chain is, they're probably in it. So, but anyways, coming back to the challenges that a lot of our clients are coming to us with from our side, our challenges with, with some of the clients is that they, like I mentioned already, they are coming with a design that they're coming to us with a logo design that's hard to work around. And we know it's not going to work, but they're not, they're resistant to change. We have a few clients who have come to us and just don't really know what, what they need to do to get to the next level. And and I don't even just mean like, like what we need to do for them, but what they need to do on their end, whether it's manufacturing, distributing, whatever the sales channel, and they don't understand those things. And some of that. What makes it a challenge is that we're also not experts in that area. We, we understand sometimes more than our clients because we have learned a lot from our clients, Mm -hmm. but the, the ones that don't know, like we may know a little bit more than them, but we're not experts. We can't really teach you that part. So that is a challenge. It's like, well, we can, we can do as much as we can on the creative side of things, but unless you know your part or you have people that you're working with or other consultants, um, on the other side, you know, the manufacturing side of things then you know, there's only so far we can go. Another challenge that we've had is probably one that we have more often is budget. <laughs> and I think every, every yeah, absolutely. consulting or every, probably every creative agency or, or marketing company would tell you the same thing is like, there's never enough budget. Well, depending on how you, how you, how you think about it, every agency will tell you that no matter what, like you can come to it with a million dollars. It's like, oh man, we only had. 500,000 more, <laughs> we can do so much, but, but really when you're working with emerging brands, it's, you know, you're, you're definitely working on smaller budgets a lot. Like a lot of our clients can't do a custom engineered bottle, glass or plastic bottle for their juice or whatever beverage brand, like they're working with whatever standard we've got to find a way to make a unique label. Cool. We kind of, we kind of enjoy those challenges because for us creatively, like Creative people are brainstormers by or are problem solvers by nature. Mm-hmm. So it's we we understand what the parameters are, and then we decide how can we work within that to make something that's unique and not just a rectangle label that goes all the way around your bottle. It's like, can we do something unique with how it's positioned or where it's positioned or a die cut or you know whatever whatever we can think of? And a lot of times, clients are surprised to learn that the things that we come up with, like die cuts. In the long run, don't really add much to your bottom line. Like they don't add much cost. Mm-hmm. Like there's not much extra cost. Like a three hundred dollar die for a label is pretty minuscule over ten thousand units. <laughs> like it's what is the three cents then? Something I don't know, but it's it's pretty easy to take on some of those things. So doing creative stuff like that to work around that 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 issue, but also like we've we've tried to teach some clients. Just like what, how, how much things cost. And I'm happy to get into that as well, too. Like when clients are looking at packaging, whether it's the actual physical package or if it's just a label, 
understanding how much those things cost and understanding what else we can do besides packaging and our costs that go into that and what's maybe like most effective way to spend your money. We could, we, we done a bit of educating for clients with that as well, too. Hopefully that answers the question. I know there's a kind of a few things I've talked about there as far as challenges nope. go. Uh, that, that definitely you guys, do, you, do you see, do you see a lot of this, the same stuff and what you do? So I was just, the only thing, comment I was thinking of is when you're talking about making the, instead of making something more than just a square label, they slap on a, on a, a beverage. I've seen a lot of this, the, these really intricately artistically designed wraps for, especially for, for beer lately. And they almost like, they're almost to the point of now they're stained glass window esque. And I didn't, I just, I, I, it seems like a very popular trend blowing up, almost like a screen printing for beer bottles. And in a way, yeah. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, on just like the, the craziness of the labels, I mean, yeah, or... they're just super intricate, super artistic. They're almost like freehanded stuff and they're put on and they're just these real, real intricate labels now, but they're, but yes. for the most part, it's just a rectangular label. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it depends on, it depends on who you're targeting, like who's the, who's the yeah. customer, but, but I, I, beer is different. Beer is so, it's such, it's such a, like, it's kind of, it's, it's all in, category like i would separate it from most other beverages coffee is getting to be that way too but beer because it's you wouldn't i want to call it a commodity of course but it's it's i forget this specific statistics i know we looked at these like 2016 nielsen did a survey and kind of reported back some findings on like just the craft beer aisle in general like what people what people or like what percentage of people are basing their purchase on certain Mm-hmm. certain things, whether it's the, the logo or just the packaging or colors or whatever other stuff. What I, what was, I'll come back to some interesting facts with that too, but when it comes to beer, so much of the purchase is dependent upon your packaging that you see a lot of mm. brand, like craft brands trying to do crazy stuff. Like just the design is like super crazy and, and mm-hmm. very complex. But then when you walk down the aisle, the ones that you see that stand out the most are the simpler designs. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean that a brand is better or worse because of that, but you you have to understand in your category, this is, you know, beer or any other category, like what's going to be around you. If everything else is very simple and minimalist, maybe you should go the other way. But in the beer aisle, if everything else is crazy, like there's a lot of, you, you mentioned hand-drawn um, mm-hmm. sort of artwork that's on these mm-hmm. It's distracting, but is it like meaningful? <laughs> you know, like people, I don't, I don't know necessarily if craft beer drinkers are buying stuff or buying beer because they find it as an art piece or like the label as an art piece, but like all you're trying to do is get this, I don't know, this idea. Yeah. The reason that beer, the beer, the reason that beer is so tricky is because a lot of it tastes the same. And I don't, I don't mean that to offend beer drinkers because I know that there's your IPAs, your your amber ales, your stouts, whatever, like all, there's all the different kinds. Like they do, there's probably 15 to 20 different kinds of beer. But if you take five IPAs and you give them to someone who's not a like top 10% expert taste per whatever beer taster in the world, no one's gonna be able to tell you which, which one is which. They won't be able to tell you yeah. which brand is which. We won't be able to tell you which individual brew is which. So you're trying to grab their attention and get them to buy just based on the packaging. That's what I was, so coming back to the Nielsen stuff, there, the, the interesting things to me, it was like 70% of people chose based on the packaging. It, all of these statistics were around like 70% of people is, I don't say they're like range from like 70 to 80%, but, um, the majority of people based their decision on like the packaging and the color and the logo. But the interesting thing was craft beer drinkers, and this is specific to craft beer drinkers, probably not any other category, craft beer drinkers go to the liquor store knowing they're going to buy a craft beer, Mm -hmm. but they do not have a predetermined brand or product that they're going to buy. They make that decision while they're standing in front of it. So they're like, I know, and I, I, I'm a craft beer drinker, so I'm kind of the same way. Like, and I, I thought about this after I saw this statistic. Okay. That's me. Like I'll, if I'm, especially if I'm like not in my local stores, if I'm like visiting family, I'm like, my wife's family is from Minnesota. If we go to a liquor store in Minnesota, I'm going to, I know that I want craft beer. I don't just want Bud Light or I'm not a Miller drinker. It's disgusting. If you drink Miller, you should go here. 
Yeah, I don't want my you know, I don't want a mainstream light light beer. I want something that's craft that someone put some work into and I like to support those local businesses. But you know, I'm gonna base my decision on on whatever stands out to me on the shelf there. And I know my flavor taste and stuff. So like I'm gonna look for an IPA over something else probably, but 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 I'm gonna pick based on the packaging. So this other was interesting. It was like interesting. I'm yeah. one of those people. Like I am the, the statistic. <laughs> I walk into the store without it, knowing which one I'm gonna get. But but uh, it was interesting too. So same, yeah, it's the same thing. It, yeah, you mentioned some earlier that back is like you said. Even coffee's kind of getting into this because they're all making everything so. And it comes back to my uniquely your, theirs is the, the labeling almost they want it to be craft as well. And I think that's maybe what they're trying to match the tone. Mm-hmm. And then you said then you kind of supported that with coming back with yeah they're 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 trying to single themselves out from everybody else. But then at the same time, I really like that contrast that it's the simpler this is what this is kind of label that's really mm-hmm. people that's what people are taking off the shelves now again you just said you, you go in you're looking for that craft ipa what, what do you typically find yourself grabbing something that's you know super elaborate or i mean again you don't know one ipa craft ipa from the other when you're in a different state mm-hmm. what's make what do you find yourself grabbing i i tend to lean towards the the label that's a little bit cleaner looking okay um, but like i'm yeah, it, it's just, it's yeah. a different audience. It's a different audience because like we even within craft craft beer and the same goes for coffee. And I'll touch on that mm-hmm. here in a second too. But um, with craft beer, like I am, I am a like cleaner. I don't want to call myself organized because that's probably not true. Should we ask my wife? But but like oh. I'm, I I want the the cleaner looking thing. So like that's, that's the part that appeals to me and stands out to me. But within craft beer, you also have the types who are skaters and like they mm-hmm. listen to punk rock, like, you know, like that, that sort of person, like maybe a busier label appeals to that person. So it's really just, it comes down to under, understanding that customer, but like with, with craft beer, like there's a lot of overlap and tying this back to coffee, there's, there's a lot of overlap in the customers there too. So with us working with over 70 different coffee brands, we yeah. have, we've, we've covered the spectrum of like very minimalist onto like the very busy design and everything in between, but it all depends like, like who we're trying to target. Yep. So, so it all depends on like who we're trying to target. So like, we know when we start working with a new coffee brand, of course we're working with a craft coffee drinker. They're choosing craft coffee because they don't want to drink Folgers or Starbucks, or maybe they drink Starbucks, but they want to have something at home. That's not going to cost them $8 every time they drink it. They, they, whatever. So there's a particular craft coffee drinker. But within that segment, there's still lots of smaller sub segments and that's mm-hmm. who we would need to find out who we're targeting. And with a new coffee brand, like they don't have data to back up who's already drinking their products. We have to determine who that is. We have to speculate, but then we have to figure out, we have, we have to speculate a lot of like who that person is, their personality, what their interests, but then we, then we need to use that to appeal or to, to make our creative work to appeal to that audience. Um, so, so, so that, de- that determines a lot of like, you know, are we going to go rustic mm-hmm. with it? Is this a very like blue collar type of community Do they want dark, like dark colors, or is this a younger crowd and something that's brighter, more vibrant is going to stand up to them. And those are like some <laughs> really like generalities, but like we get more nuance than that one when we're creating. Oh yeah. I, I, I do it. We kind of went down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but it's actually, it's still, it's still definitely on, on, on path of what we were talking about is I, I really was. That's very interesting with the statistics and the clean and the, and, the, and you and you you just you came back to targeting the the client who was who was for so that's key and that's maybe a last one of the last couple of questions I have is what could a, a brand or a, a coffee shop a brewery any beverage industry that thinks they're getting close to that place where they want to uh, take that next step what kind of what could you tell them right now to kind of improve that? What do they need to ask themselves to kind of solve to solve that riddle of, is this something we need right now to take that next step? Yes, yeah, t- that's a, a tough question. So I guess what they need to ask themselves, are they, are they ready? First off is, is probably the most general one, but like, are you, are you ready? Are you wanting to? Cause a lot of people are completely satisfied with like where they're at and like, they don't need to grow. They don't want to grow. Mm-hmm. Like they're they're happy, like everything is covered, it's comfortable, whatever. If you are wanting to grow, ask yourself who 
who are the people that are using our products now? Understand, is there a lot more of them that you can be reaching or do you need to reach a new audience? Um, and that's, that's where part of like our branding or rebranding can come into play sometimes, but understanding mm -hmm. like, and get as much hard data as you can. So whether that's, you know, surveying your current customers as best you can, if you have a coffee shop, mm -hmm. offer a, offer a free, a free coffee or a drink or per percentage discount to fill out a short survey. Um, understand who, understand who they are. How often do they drink your product? What sort of setting are they drinking your product in? Like, is it breakfast, like at home, just between meals to get through the day in the morning or the afternoon? Um, crazy person drinking at nine o'clock at nothing. <laughs> but do they drink decaf? Do they want, do they want flavored coffee more than, um, straight black coffee? Are they doing a mixed coffee drink? Find out as much as you can about this. And obviously find out your demographics, age, gender, locations, stuff like that. All that stuff really helps. But try to remember your original question. It was it was oh, that, actually what, your what, your your tip on that was perfect. That's what I was after. I was kind of after a tip and an idea. And the tip that you gave people is like, well, go out and, you know, offer a a, a small gift card or offer some free taste of their coffee or beverage for them answering a quick survey and just learning more about how, how else they generate that data. Even it, and that's also effective if you're brand new too. So, I mean, that's kind of what I was after. Exactly. I was after I was like, what, what could they do to help <laughs> themselves to get themselves towards like saying, yes, I need, I, I, um, I need avidity or I'm still working towards that. So that is yeah. a great tip. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like I said, if you're trying to, if, if you're trying, if you know that you want to grow, it's understanding it's understanding where you are, but then also understanding what, understanding what you, where you want to be. Like mm -hmm. we do a lot, if we're going through a rebranding with the client that's been in business for five plus years, they kind of know who they are at that point. So we want to know then the customers, we want to get hard data through some sort of surveys if we can, of like, what is their opinions of your brand? And not only like, oh, I think your logo is cool. I love your colors. I mean, like, yeah, are they, are they telling you that like, if you, if you do a survey and you're, you're speculating that most of your audience is males that are 40 to 60 years old. And then you come to find out that it's, you know, maybe it's a little more neutral. You have a pretty balance of male, female, and your age range spans now from 25 to 30 or to, to 40. Like that's quite a difference of who we're targeting here. So, but then also like we, we did some surveying with some previous clients of like, what are some adjectives they would use to describe this or, you know, our client's brand. And then we will come back and meet with the client and be like, here's what they're saying. Your brand tells them, is this what you want to be telling them? Or do we need to change that image? It's not so much like, oh, they have a negative image and we need to make it a positive image. No, it's like they may, the customers are usually going to give positive feedback. If they're customers, they're customers for reason. They're going to give positive feedback. But is it the message that you're actually wanting them to tell? Like, or is it? Or is the message you're trying to get across to them something different? If that's the case, then we need to rethink what we're doing, whether it's, you know, if it's, if it's colors, if it's your logo, if it's just the messaging, is it where they're being reached, social media versus POPs yeah. and, and stores, things like that. So. All right. So I got two last questions here. And one, this one yeah. is some, sometimes difficult for some people. Sometimes it's the easiest thing in the world. I, I'm yeah. curious about this. So what's your favorite beverage? It's tough. I saw the, that question on the list, and I, so I was trying to do some thinking first. I'm very boring, so in my 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 real answer would just be like original Coca Cola. Like that's I probably drink original Coca Cola. Like, I probably drink I probably drink drink like four four or five a week. But for a better <laughs> answer, for for to give you a better answer for this question, to give you something that's a little more unique and not just not just boring of like mm -hmm. drink soda. Because honestly, like while we work with coffee, a lot of coffee companies, I'm not the coffee drinker in our family. So and our yeah. clients know that. So no, no one needs to feel a, a reason to go tell all our clients, <laughs> hey, you're working with a guy who doesn't drink coffee. No, they all know that. I've talked to them. That's like the first thing I bring up. It's like, hey, we work with a coffee brand, but I don't drink much coffee. So I love the smell of it. I would wear it as color for good. But anyways, I'm I'm also big into CrossFit. And like the first mm -hmm. rule of CrossFit is you have to talk about CrossFit. So, <laughs> but so, so from that, like one of the recovery drinks that I drink a lot is O2, O2 brand okay. product, mm -hmm. um, a variety of flavors, but it's a, it's a recovery drink. I think it's mostly hydration stuff, but there's electrolytes and things in there. 
Mm. I'll, I'll drink Gatorade too, but this but O2 is what I would suggest as my favorite non-mainstream Perfect. beverage to drink. Yeah. yeah. All right. Tastes good and it's good for me. So Yeah, that's great. That's great. Good. Thanks for sharing. And then finally, is there any, we, we talked about a lot of tips. We've talked a lot of storytelling. Is there any, like, I don't know if you have any promotions, but is there anything you could, you want to point to potential yeah. um, people to? Yeah. So if anyone listens to, to this episode is either just interested in, you know, like you've thought about rebranding or you thought about like redesigning a packaging or like if you're just getting started, it's like, well, what do I, what do I need? So we'll, what we're offering is a, a free brand audit. Basically just reach out to, so when you go to aviditycreative.com and I'm open here, uh, Matt, Matthew is going to have a link maybe in the, the show notes the or show something. Notes. Yes. Just go to our website, contact me and put in, put in the message that you listen to the Harvest of Poor podcast episode with me in it. Mention the, the free brand audit and then we'll send them. Basically your, your brand audit will look through your existing branding. We'll look through your existing packaging. It will look at uh, some of your competitors and then we'll give you some some feedback on like either areas that you can improve, things that you're doing well right now, and then whether we think that we would be a good help and a good fit to work with you too. So, but yeah, so go to avidityacreative.com. That's where you'll you learn more about our company, you learn about what we do, see full case studies. You can see some testimonies of what, what clients are saying about us and why they tend to work with us too and see all the other services we do besides graphic design. So, be yeah. great. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. And I'm sure our listeners will too. All right, yeah. Adam, this has been awesome. I I mean, I love how that you, you know, you niche down from your, your background, finding that CPGs were the place to be for food and beverage. I love kind of telling that little product story between between Pivot North, you and Freeze, it, yeah. Family Freeze. And yeah, I, just, uh, I really enjoy having you on. I'm hoping some information you shared kind of provide some clarity for any beverage industry out there looking to take that next step. Again. I agree. Yeah, Matthew, it's been great to be on, be on the show, and I appreciate having, or, or excuse me, I appreciate you having <laughs> me. <laughs> so he used to have a pod. Well, he still has a podcast, but um, he's yeah, yeah. working on it right now. So I think it's yeah, yeah it, it's the habit. I get it. It was, it was natural. <laughs> All right. yeah. It was natural. Yeah. All awesome. right. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Harvest of Poor, the business of beverages with Matthew Shep. Check the show notes for our guest contact information. And connect with Matthew Shipp on LinkedIn today.